The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, and welcome to another edition of the RX Question Lab. This is Jeff Downing, your host, and we are thrilled to have you with us as we uh, embark on a journey to enhance our ability to tackle board style questions with a focus on HEMOC. So, uh, you know, again, for, you know, for, for many of us, the, uh, the, you know, the journey towards mastering the OSMLA, it's a, cha it's a challenging one. It's, you know, filled with complex uh, questions, often test our knowledge to the limits, but that's why we're here tonight. We're going to help you navigate these turbulent waters, uh, you know, obviously answering you know, board stock questions, one of the highest yield activities you can engage in while studying uh, for the exam. So, uh, you know, we know they're complex uh, and we feel like, you know, hey, with the right approach, you can, uh, you know, you can succeed. So uh, tonight, like I said, we're going to focus on HEMONC and we're going to do that joined by our special uh, co-host, Dr. Abraham Titus. Abraham, would you like to introduce yourself to the crowd? Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so my name is Abraham Titus. I'm currently a hematology oncology fellow at the University of South Alabama, and I completed my residency in internal medicine. Uh, and I've been a tutor with Scholar Rx for about five years now. Wow. Uh, I've taught many students like yourselves uh, and helped them, you know, achieve their goals for both step one and step two. And um, I hope, uh, you know, we can get through the session and you guys take something away from this. Excellent. Thank you, Abraham. We uh, also are joined by Kate, uh, who's going to be answering your questions. And um, right now, having a little issue here with uh, the the screen. So let me see. Hopefully, we are uh, we're we're coming through clearly now. Uh, but yes, uh, like we said, we're going to be uh, uh, getting into hematology, oncology. Uh, and, and again, uh, this is one of uh, Abraham's specialties, so glad that he's able to join us. So again, grab your notes, uh, open your minds, let's get ready for a productive session. So with that, I'm going to open up question number one. And the first thing you're going to see is what? No answer choices, right? And that is uh, by design. That's our, our first step is to cover up the answer choices. Uh, if you're new to Question Lab, uh, you may you know may not know that for us we again we want you to be focused and it's easy to get distracted if you see an answer choice uh, that contains a disorder or a concept that you just don't know very well or something that's confused you in the past. Um, so our goal is to say, hey, let's focus first. Let's cover up those answer choices and. Uh, look at that lead-in. And the lead-in is the question. So that's step two. Look at that lead-in. And in this case, the lead-in is which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's anemia? Okay, so, you know, part of the, you know, the idea here is that, okay, we've covered up the answer choices. So now you're, you're focused, uh, a little more focused. You, we read the lead-in and now we understand, okay, what they're going to be asking us uh, which can help us as we look at, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, the vignette, what kind of data should we be looking for? What are the, what are some of the clues for us to pick up on? So with that, we can now read the vignette. A 14 year old male is brought to the clinic because of yellow discoloration of his eyes for one day. This developed four days after he had a two day illness marked by fever and watery diarrhea. And we've listed some of the lab studies here, the hemoglobin, hematocrit, platelet count, uh, leukocyte count, reticulocyte count, indirect bilirubin, and uh, a Coombs test is negative, and a peripheral blood smear with crystal violet staining is shown in the, uh, the, the slide here. So again, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's anemia? So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to turn it over to Abraham here in a second. But first, I'd love you to go down to the uh, for you to go down to the question box and let us know how many steps you think it will take to solve this question. You think it's a one step, two step, three step question? 
let us know in the question box as I turn it over to Abraham. All right. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, as you can see here, a few things have been highlighted since the next question. And we still haven't looked at the uh, answer choices just yet. But our goal here, as you mentioned, is to have a systemic approach to answering these questions. As we, we read the uh, lead in and we know the question is asking about the cause of the anemia. The things we that are, I would say, are most important in this question, you know, you want to know age, you want to know the demographic. You want to know if it's a kid, if it's an elderly person, if it's a pregnant person. It changes your thought process. Yellow discoloration of his eyes. So that's the scleral icterus, right? That's a sign of jaundice. So that means that something is causing either uh, his cells to lice and releasing bilirubin or his liver is the problem. So you have to kind of have that two thought process going on at the same time. And again, four days after a recent infection. Uh, so that is also an important thing. So something triggered this thing to happen. And we're trying to figure out what this could be. Of the labs, the hemoglobin of 11 is important. So that's low, that's anemia, with the hematocrit being uh, same as that. Uh, platelet count and leukocyte count, they look all right to me. I'm not worried too much about that. Reticulocyte count of 4.8, that is high, right? So it's more than 2%. So that means that, what does that mean? That means that I am making more cells. So the body is making cells. So we have to think to ourselves, is the hemoglobin being low a problem with us producing cells or is, is it a problem because cells are dying off too fast? So that is the way to think about this, right? So right now we are in a situation where we have maybe cells dying off too quick because we are able to make cells because of the high reticulocyte capacity. And then the indirect bilirubin being 3.6 is also high. And that is what's causing the jaundice. And that also indicates that this could be because cells are dying off. Now, pictures are important. Uh, in most situations for step one, you are able to answer the question just from the stem itself. But understanding the picture and interpreting the little details that they give you, especially for the slides, will just make your life a lot easier. So here you can see a bunch of RBCs with some black spots in it. Does anyone know what these black spots are? Well, these are what's called Heinz bodies. All right. Now, uh, I want you guys to take a moment and tell me what you guys think the answer would be here. So we have our options A, B, C, D, and E. So when we take up our options, when we when we get to the options, we like to read from E and go up. Uh, it's just a kind of a, a methodology we use. It kind of gets over the initial impression of picking the first answer you see. So if I look at E, it's sideroblastic anemia. Could it be D, sickle cell anemia? Could it be C, hereditary spherocytosis? Could it be B, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, also known as G6PD deficiency? Or could it be A, autoimmune hemolytic anemia? So I'm going to give you guys a chance to answer the question, and then we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail. Okay, so we've launched the poll, and apologies, I... Uh, I think I, I I set up the slides so we get to the uh, the answer choices one slide too soon, but that's okay. Uh, you're you can cover up that that part of the screen here until we're ready for it. In the meantime, go ahead and uh, let us know what you think the answer is. Like I said, we will wait until about two thirds of you have cast your vote. Looks like there is a pretty uh, uh, commanding favorite so far. Let's give you a few more seconds and we'll get ready to close this one down and share the results. Okay, so we're going to close it. And here's what you guys thought. So um, over half of you went with uh, answer choice B, glucose 6-phosphate de dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, and then the, you know, the second place, kind of a tie between answer choices A and E. Uh, and some of you were thinking sickle cell disease and a few with hereditary spherocytosis. So um, interesting spread, but most of you were going with B. So let's go ahead and hide the results and reveal the answer. And the answer is B. So congratulations, the uh, the uh, the community wins uh, with 
with question number one tonight. Nice job, everybody. If you didn't get it right, that's okay. Uh, Abraham's going to walk through this one for us. Abraham? Abraham, are you on mute? Oh, yes, I was. Sorry about that. Uh, so as I as I mentioned earlier, I did give you guys a couple of clues when I was going through the question. You know, these black spots on the smear are what we call Heinz bodies, and these are pathognomonic for G6PD deficiency. Uh, a few other clues here, like the reticulocyte count being high and the indirect bilirubin being high, also kind of point towards G6PD deficiency. Now, what is G6PD deficiency? This enzyme kind of protects the red blood cells against oxidative stress and damage. It reduces any kind of superoxidants or anything that can come and destroy the RBCs. So what happens is that since this is deficient, our cells are much more susceptible to damage from these oxidative stress. And that is what these Heinz bodies are. These are just denatured hemoglobin within the RBCs. Now, when these things get denatured, they can either cause a cell to lyse, and that would be intravascular hemolysis, or it can cause it to be damaged enough so that when it goes to the spleen, it gets destroyed extravascularly. So it, it's a combination of intravascular and extravascular hemolysis, and that is the picture that this story, this question is painted. So good job on all of you guys that got it correct. And um, the other options we can definitely talk about very quickly, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, typically, there's going to be some type of story of, about a, a a lupus patient or a recent CLL diagnosis, something along those lines that would give you the clue. Uh, hereditary spherocytosis, I get these things kind of do look like spherocytes, but really these are just Heinz bodies. So the particular smear that they used and the image they're showing you, uh, although they does, don't have that central pallor we see in typically in RBCs, this is not uh, hereditary spherocytosis. And it would not explain the hemolytic, hemolytic picture given in the question. Sickle cell, obviously we would see sickles in the smear. Uh, and it would typically be the story of an African-American or someone with bone pain or something along those lines. And sideroblastic anemia is going to be a form of microcytic anemia, not lysis. It's going to be a production problem. So the reticulocyte count being high rules that one out. Okay, excellent. Okay, so everyone, we're off to a good start. That was uh, that was a strong showing for question number one. We'll see if we can keep it going as we enter question number two. So again, we have the answer choices covered up, and we're going to start off by reading the lead-in. Which of the following mechanisms characterizes the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Okay, so again, uh, take a look at that. Think about what kind of information you should be keeping your eyes open for as we read the vignette. A 21-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of severe leg and back pain. He has had similar episodes in the past, which he attributed to overexertion or dehydration, but never sought medical attention. His father had similar symptoms and died of a chest problem. Examination reveals scleral icterus and diffuse bony tenderness. Here are the lab studies. You can see the, uh, the labs for... White blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, mean corpuscular volume, and platelet count. So again, which of the following mechanisms characterizes the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Head down to the question box. Let us know what, uh, how many steps you think it will take to solve this one as I hand it off to Abraham. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so as you can see, some of the words here are highlighted. These are what I think kind of gives you the biggest clues for answering this question. Right. 21 year old male. Again, we got to know demographics. Always pay attention to that. It's going to give you a big clue, especially for hematology oncology when you're dealing with certain cancers that are more prevalent in certain age groups and more blood disorders, uh, more common in certain age groups. Uh, severe leg and back pain and has had similar episodes in the past. So it's not something that's new. It's something that's been going on for a while, and it's worse when he overexerts himself or he is dehydrated. So there is something that should be kind of ring some bells in your mind when you hear things like that. Uh, he did have a family history of similar stuff. He had a father with 
who died of a chest problem. Again, very vague term. This is how you're going to see patients in your clinic. They're not going to tell you the exact diagnosis. You need to be able to take that information and interpret it as a medical uh, terminology. Now, white count is 14.4. Uh, hemoglobin is 7.4. That's actually very significant. So we have a uh, anemia going on with a hemoglobin of 7.4. The MCV is only 86. So what that means is that it's a normal sized cell and the platelet count is 440. Now, which of the following mechanism characterizes the diagnosis in this patient? So we're thinking about what the mechanism could be for this, okay? And we have our options here, again, looking from E and working our way to A. Could it be a spectrin mutation? Could it be G6, uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase mutation? Could it be a beta-globin chain mutation? Could it be a beta-globin chain deficiency? or could it be an alpha chain, alpha globin chain deficiency? So you got some good options here. This is a little bit trickier than the last one. I want to see how you guys answer this one. Okay, everybody, the poll has been launched. So let us know, you choose the, the, the mechanism which characterizes the most likely diagnosis in this patient. I think the, uh, the general consensus in the question box is that this is a two-step question. A couple things you have to, what you need to figure out before you can get to the answer. This multi-step questions, perhaps a little bit more prevalent on step one than, uh, than they may have been five, ten years ago. Difficulty of the test always seems to be increasing, right? Let's see, we've got almost uh, three quarters of you have voted, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you a couple seconds here, and we're gonna close the poll. Okay, let's look at the results. Uh, so again, we've got uh, overwhelming support for one of these answer options, answer choice C, beta globin chain mutation. Uh, some of you are thinking beta globin chain deficiency or spectrum mutation. Okay, so let's hide the results and reveal the answer. And the answer is answer choice C, beta globin chain mutation. So, so far we're two for two. That's a great start. Uh, nice work, everyone. For those of you who didn't get this one, that's okay. Uh, this is the time to get it wrong because now you're going to uh, learn how to make sure you get it right on test day. And Abraham's going to do that for you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Good job, guys. Yeah, that was a little bit trickier than the last one, but you guys didn't even uh, trip up at all. So really, the, the big clues here that are going to tell us the diagnosis is the story, right? We have somebody who's young, who's had histories of these kind of vague severe attacks and pain, which is worse with dehydration exertion, and has a family history of this as well. So those are the big clues, along with the picture that they're uh, painting here with the labs, with the anemia that's going on, along with the scleral icterus. Again, same thing, that scleral icterus, I saw a question about that. Why does he have scleral icterus? It's the bilirubin building up and causing the jaundice and the yellowing of the skin and the eyes. So this is a diagnosis. So number step one is coming up with the diagnosis is sickle cell anemia. So this patient has been diagnosed with sickle cell anemia just based on the story. Now, step one is not as easy as what is a diagnosis every single time, right? You need to take it one step further. What is a mechanism that characterizes the diagnosis? So, and you're correct. It is the beta globin chain mutation, right? So it is a mutation in the beta globin chain, which leads to these cells that become sickled whenever they get in this dehydrated state and that's what leads to these medical all these other medical problems they can have bone crisis they can have chest uh, chest pain they can have any kind of vaso occlusive crisis and thrombosis which then causes uh, these clinical presentations looking at the other options a spectrin mutation what would a spectrin mutation lead to it would lead to hereditary spherocytosis so similar to uh, it is similar in a sense to sickle cell anemia, but it is a completely different entity. It is where instead of the cells, instead of the cells sickling, they turn into spheres and they don't fit their way through the 
spleen, and that leads to well, splenomegaly and hemolysis in the spleen, which can eventually require a splenectomy. Uh, a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase mutation, similar to what we talked about earlier, the G6PD deficiency, the hemolytic anemia, the Heinz bodies, none of those things were present in the situation. Uh, a beta globin chain deficiency, that is what we call a beta thalassemia. It's an inherited anemia. Now, could this be the situation in this one? He, his father has it, but this, neither beta thalassemia or option A, alpha thalassemia, present with any kind of pain crisis, any vasoclosive phenomenon, but they both can have the anemia, which tends to be microcytic in nature. But in this situation, just with the how the story and they, they're kind of building the idea of a family history and having these vague, severe episodes of pain, that should point towards sickle cell. And it's a very common condition, and we have to know it inside out. Okay, very good. Thank you, Abraham. So, so far, so good tonight, halfway through. And uh, like I said, we're two for two. Got a couple more questions to go. So uh, let's see how we can do. Uh, I do want to note that, um, you know, we, uh, you know, Abraham here is one of our RX coaches. Um, and, you know, our, our, our program is, uh, you know, designed to help students like you, students that uh, are uh, looking to to do their best on test day, and there's a lot of different you know factors that can you know impact us when we're getting ready for the boards. Um, so you know our approach is we want to learn as much about you and where you're at um, so that we can personalize our plan for you. So we have a 160 question um, assessment that uh, helps us kind of ferret out your uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and then we work with you to, uh, to to put together a study plan with one of our RX certified tutors. Um, so right now we, um, uh, you know, our our site is uh, um, is is not live, uh, but if you are interested, you can uh, email us at the uh, the email that I've put in the chat. Uh, so if you're interested uh, in, uh, in in setting up a consult to learn more about the program let us know. With that, I'm going to open up question number three. And uh, as always, we've got the uh, the answer choices covered up to start it off. And we're going to read that lead in. Which of the following is the strongest predisposing risk factor for this patient's most likely condition? Okay, so again, looking for risk factors, looking to figure out what this patient's condition is, right? So now that we know what we're, um, we're, we're keeping an eye out for, let's read the vignette. A seven-year-old girl is brought to her pediatrician because of two-week history of fevers, bone, pain, and fatigue. Temperature is 38.2. Physical examination shows diffuse non-tender lymphadenomath lymphadenopathy and diffuse petechiae over her trunk and lower limbs. Here are lab studies. You can see the white blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, platelet count, and we also have a peripheral blood smear shown. So again, which of the following is the strongest predisposing risk factor for this patient's most likely condition? Head over to the question box. Let us know how many steps you think it'll take to solve this one as I pass it over to Abraham. All right. Thanks, Jeff. So let me see how many steps you think this is. This is a little bit more of an intense question in a sense, in the sense that they expect you to not only diagnose the patient and figure out what's going on just based on the history and the slide, they want you to know what the strongest predisposing risk factor is. All right. So things that I would think are very important in this question, uh, just by reading it, again, seven-year-old girl, right? We're dealing with oncology or hematology. We have to always understand your demographic. Uh, we have a two-week history of fevers, bone pain, and fatigue. So pretty general symptoms. It could be really anything at this point just by reading that. It could be you know, viral infection. But let's read a little bit further. So, you know, the, we said fever, so 100.7, okay, low-grade fever, diffuse non-tender lymphadenopathy. Again, the key word here is diffuse non-tender. 
right? So if this was a viral infection, bacterial infection, you're more likely to see tender lymphadenopathy as opposed to non-tender lymphadenopathy. So that should start getting your gears thinking as well. Our white count is 34,000. That's really high, right? That's not something that we should normally see, right? That So that, again, if you see a high white count, could it be an infection? Could it be something else? That's what you should be thinking about in this situation. Hemoglobin of 8.8 .8 is low and a platelet count of 90, which is low, 90,000, which is low. So you have a high white count with a low RBC and a low platelet count. So that should also be painting a picture for you here. And the peripheral smear, we see a bunch of funky looking cells. They're real big and purple. We'll talk about this as well after you, got, you guys pick an answer. So we have five options here. Uh, option E is trisomy 21. Option D is a retroviral infection of the T cells. Option C is an infection of the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV virus. Uh, option B is folic acid deficiency. And option A is deletion of the VHL gene. So great options here. Uh, let's take a poll and see what where you guys are thinking before we break down what the answer actually is. Okay, so the poll has been launched. Go ahead and let us know which of the following is the strongest predisposing risk factor for this patient's most likely condition. Have you figured out what this patient has? That's, uh, you know, part of the challenge here. Uh, again, we always remind you, on, on test day, you don't want to leave any questions left unanswered. It's not going to count against you. And during Question Lab, we definitely don't want you to leave any questions unanswered. So uh, even if you're a little unsure, give it a rip. Okay, we've got uh, getting close to two-thirds of you have voted. Let's uh, give you a few more seconds. Folks are a little bit slower on the trigger with this one, but um, I think we've got a another a strong front runner. So let's go ahead and close the poll and share those results. So um, once again, uh, we've got pretty uh, pretty strong leader here, Trisomy 21, with over half of the votes tonight. About a quarter of you went with um, an infection by Epstein-Barr virus, and uh, and some of you were thinking deletion of the VHL gene. Okay, very interesting. So let's um, let's go ahead and hide the results and reveal the answer. And the answer is answer choice E, trisomy 21. So uh, this is uh, this has been a great crowd tonight because you guys are three for three. And, uh, and 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 looked strong in every question so far. So with that, uh, you know, again, if you didn't get this one right, if there's something about this one that uh, I was confusing you, that's okay. Abraham is gonna uh, is gonna coach you to the answer here. Abraham, awesome, great job, guys. So this is again another classic question of malignant hematology. Right, so this is that bridge between your hematology cases and your oncology cases as a, a malignant hematology case. So when I see a young, young patient coming in with a high white count and non-tender lymphadenopathy, bells are ringing in my head. I should be thinking that this patient has something that's making her cells grow uncontrollably. The diagnosis here is ALL also known as acute lymphoblastic leukemia, okay? Now, the big clues here that kind of point towards acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the age is the biggest thing that, that gives me the clue. Number two, it's the high white count with the low hemoglobin and low platelets. The white counts are pushing everything else in the bone marrow down. The white count is taking over. Now, the fact that it's an acute leukemia would tell me that there you will expect to see blasts in the peripheral smear. Greater than 20% blast is an indication that you are dealing with an acute process rather than a chronic process. So if I look at this peripheral smear here, look how big these lymphocytes are. These are lymphocytes with large nuclei. 
these are what we call blast cells, right? They have some blast cells and they have, uh, and, and compared to the story here, you sh when you see a, a, a field here, it should primarily be he, uh, RBCs that you see in this, in this usual smear. So the fact that you're seeing so many purple spots that indicate that lots of big lymphocytes are growing, that is a clue that we're dealing with an ALL situation. Now, that is step one, right? Diagnosing ALL. Step two is, you know, what is the risk factor? What ALL, you know, be, being young is one of the big risk factors for ALL, but a trisomy 21. Patients with trisomy 21 are Down syndrome patients. These are the patients with the highest risk for developing ALL. And that is something you have to memorize, you have to know, as it is a factoid they love to test. And that's why I wanted to throw this question in there, just because I've seen this question multiple times throughout uh, many years of uh, teaching USMLE, that I think this is a fact that you should definitely drive into your brain. Now, going into the other options, we have retroviral infection of a T cells. Again, a few of you guys picked this one. Uh, what's the retro, uh, retrovirus we're talking about here? This is either HIV or the HCLV virus. Either of them are associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and adult T-cell leukemias. So not really dealing with an AML story or ALL story here, like we're talking about. Infection of Epstein-Barr virus. That was the actual second best answer here that you guys picked. Um, and it's not a bad choice. Epstein-Barr virus, we have that association in the back of our brain. It's got something to do with cancer. Well, the ones that you have to know that EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus, is associated with is Burkitt's lymphoma. That's the one if you see uh, it's a younger African-American child, it will be in the jaw. And if it's a European descent or Middle Eastern descent, it's usually in the abdomen. So it's the Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that is the association that you have to know for EBV. There's a couple other malignancy associations as well, but this is the main one that we're going to be focusing on. VHL, the von Hippau-Lindau disease. This is a mutation that can lead to highly vascular tumors, right? So things that have a lot of blood vessels are what's primarily affected in the eyes, in the skin, hemangioblastomas, in the brain. That's the way you should be considering this. So there's nothing in the story that are pointing me towards multiple blood vessel tumors all over the body. And particularly for VHL, we have to think about renal cell carcinoma. And we have our folic acid deficiency. I jumped here a little bit, but folic acid deficiency, we know that this is our classic anemia case with an MCV that's greater than 100, our megaloblastic picture here. And these patients will have on the smear, not blast cells, we will see hypersegmented neutrophils. That's going to be the big clue for folic acid deficiency. All right, good job, guys. Yes, nice work, everyone. Abraham, quick question for you. How many steps uh, would you uh, consider this particular question? So this uh, this particular question, I would consider it uh, probably a three step. Uh, if I was being generous, I think I think you you can do it in two steps, but three steps seems to be the situation here. Step one, diagnosing this, right? So getting the picture, getting the story, using the smear, getting the diagnosis of ALL. Number two, knowing the risk factor. Okay, knowing the risk factor of uh, ALL is either a very, very young patient or a Down syndrome patient. That's step two. Now, Down syndrome is not in the options. That's step three. Knowing that Down syndrome is trisomy 21 is step three, and that's how you would get to the answer. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, and uh, nice work, everyone. We are, um, we've reached our, our, our final question of the evening. Again, we're going to have a raffle uh, at the end, so uh, make sure you hang around. Also, uh, talk a little bit about uh, our special offer. So let us open up our final question of the night. And uh, the image is covering up. <laughs> We've covered up the, uh, the, the answer choices, and I've also um, partially covered up the, uh, the vignette, but we will uh, we'll go forward. So um, the lead in here is. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for this patient's increased total protein concentration? Okay, so uh, what do we know? Well, patients uh, had some increased uh, total protein concentration, right? So what uh, you know, what we're going to be looking for in the vignette is uh, you know trying to figure out um, you know why that happened. So let's read that vignette. A 63-year-old female comes to her primary care physician because of progressively worsening back pain during the past several weeks. She also reports increased urination. Her pulse is 90 
and her blood pressure is 122 over 78. The physical examination discloses moderate point tenderness over the L4 to L5 vertebrae. Laboratory studies show blood urea nitrogen of 16, creatinine of 1.7, calcium of 13.1, and total protein of 10.4. A CT scan of the spine is shown here. So again, the question, which of the following is the most likely explanation for this patient's increased protein concentration? Let us know down there in the question box how many steps you think it's going to take to solve this question as I turn it over to Abraham. All right. Thank you, Jeff. So this one's a little bit more of a toughie, okay? There, there's multiple steps involved in this question, and I want you guys to kind of think about how many steps it would take as well. Now let's go through the key words in this question. This is actually a question where you have to pay attention to the little details they give you. So again, I always love my demographics. 63-year-old female is important here. Coming to the PCP, uh, progressively worsening back pain, okay? That's the primary problem that they're coming in with. That's always important to note. It's past several weeks. Okay, how long has it been going on for? With increased urination. Okay, that seems like a random fact that they've dropped in there. Well, there's no reason they would drop that unless there's a uh, particular need for it. So that's what they're trying to point at here. Now, vitally okay has moderate point tenderness over L4 and L5. Okay, so that point tenderness, that's usually not a good sign uh, as opposed to if it's just generalized pain in the paraspinal. So that's, a, that's more reassuring for as a back pain, where if you see point tenderness, that's kind of a little bit of a, your bell should be ringing in your head there. Uh, lab values, BUN, slightly elevated. Creatinine, 1.7, that's elevated. Calcium of 13.1, that's also elevated. And we have a total protein of 10.4, also elevated. So we have kind of, a weird mixture of lab values here. And there's something that maybe you know unifies this as a diagnosis. We have the CT scan here. And as you can see here, there's a few things that should be pointing towards. But again, I don't want to give too much away. But think about where the pain is. And that's where you should generally be looking, right? So we're not radiologists here. We don't need to analyze the entire spine and catch every little thing. When they say he has point tenderness of L4, L5, generally look in that area. What do you see? And use that to help. Again, you don't need the image to always answer the question, but it does make it a lot easier. Now, let's go through the options here. So we have, so which of the flight explanation for the patient's increased total protein concentration? So it's not asking about diagnosis. It's asking about what's causing that protein elevation. E, severe dehydration. D, increased production of clotting factors and acute phase reactants. C, increased production of albumin. B, increased production of IgM molecules, or A, increased production of IgG molecules. All right, let's see what the answers are, and look, look, we can talk about this more detail once you guys answer. Okay, so this is the final question of the night. Let's see if we can close strong. Um, uh, you know, a couple of folks out there, you know, a little worried about uh, their the fact that they haven't uh, done as well tonight, and that's okay. You know, again, um, lots of, you know, this is, you know, th th these questions require uh, pretty uh, pretty substantial uh, understanding of, you know, number of different areas. And, uh, you know, you, if, uh, if it's been a while since you've gotten into hematology, or if that was, a, you know, a, an area where you, you, you struggled, um, you know, you, you may want to spend a little bit more time just kind of focusing on some of the, the core content. And I'll let, uh, you know, Abraham speak to that here in a little bit, but um, don't want you to get, um, you know, don't definitely don't want you to get discouraged. This is, uh, you know, a, another learning opportunity uh, for everybody here. Uh, let's see, we've gotten about three out of five of you have voted so far. And this is going to be an interesting one. We've got, it's um, kind of a two horse race. So um, give you a few more seconds to vote and then I'm going to close the poll. Okay. We're closing the poll. Let's go ahead and share these results. So as I said, two horse race, um, Answer choice A, increased production of IgG and increased production of IgM, right? So those are the uh, the two leading vote getters. 
some of you thought that um, increased production of albumin or increased production of clotting factors and acute phase reactants uh, might have been the most likely explanation. A few of you went with severe dehydration. So, okay, let's go ahead and hide the results and reveal the answer. And the answer to our final question tonight is answer choice A. So well awesome. done, everyone. That's that's four for four. Nice job, everybody. This is probably one of the tougher ones for the night. So if you didn't get it right, that's okay. Uh, Abraham's here for you. Go ahead, Abraham. Sorry. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so again, this was a little bit of a trickier question. Uh, it it doesn't give you, you know, everything you. Uh, it gives you everything you need, but also it spaces it out and kind of throws it into the uh, vignette, just like how you'd expect on the exam. So again, what is a diagnosis? That should be your first thought when reading through this. So we have a 63-year-old female, and then it's this back pain, right? So let's look at the CT scan and see where the issue is. So we're looking at the L4, L5 area. So when you look at the spine, you see some of these black spots located right in the middle of that spine there. Now that black spot is missing bone, right? So why does she have missing bone there? Why does she have pain in that area? So that should be a big clue here. That in combined with that high calcium, that, uh, that kidney dysfunction with the creatinine elevation, and that high protein should all point towards the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So this is going to be the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Remember the CRAB mnemonic. This goes back to your first aid. C for hypercalcemia, R for renal insufficiency, A for anemia, and B for bone lytic lesions. So that's what these bone lytic lesions they're trying to show you on the CT are. That combined with the story of an old female coming in with kidney dysfunction and hypercalcemia and the protein elevation, right? That's a very important clue as well, right? So we are dealing with a multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of our plasma cells. And plasma cells make antibodies in the body. And one of the most abundant antibodies it makes in multiple myeloma is IgG, and that is why IgG is correct. Now, why is that total protein very important? Because that is gonna be a big clue, right? I imagine they give you albumin in this question as well. The albumin should be the most abundant protein in the human body. If the albumin is normal and his total protein is very high, that means that there's something else that's contributing to that total protein. And that should be a big clue that we should be thinking about your multiple myeloma or something along those lines. Again, you will get more questions like this and this is just preparing you to think and analyze these labs and that is what's gonna get you to the answer. So let's go through these other options here. Severe dehydration, well that's important. That can cause kidney injury. Uh, that could cause some mild hypercalcemia, but it's not gonna cause uh, increased proteins. It's not gonna cause bone lytic lesions. And he doesn't have any, and he has increased urination. There's nothing pointing towards dry mucous membranes, nothing about dehydration at all. Uh, D, increased production of clotting factors and acute phase reactants. Okay, that, that is uh, kind of a variety of inflammatory conditions. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, that can cause that. Anything that's going to trigger an acute phase reactant would cause that. That can cause a mild anemia. That can cause, uh, but would not ca and cause maybe some kidney injury over time, but not really to the level we're seeing here. It wouldn't explain the total protein increase. It wouldn't explain the hypercalcemia. Increased production of albumin. Like we talked about, albumin is the most uh, abundant protein in the human body. And that would typically be seen in a dehydration situation, but it would not explain all the picture. We want a unifying diagnosis and multiple myeloma fits that. Now, the second best option that everybody picked was IgM, right? So IgM, there is a condition that does cause increased production of IgM. And it's not multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is IgG. Okay, just because M and M, that's the trick. Multiple myeloma is IgM, oh, sorry, IgG. And IgM production is seen in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And that is typically associated with increased viscosity. And it's all about that hyperviscosity problem. So strokes, that's the kind of story that you're gonna be seeing, hepatosplenomegaly, vision problems. That's gonna be the story that they paint when they talk about Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia, as opposed to your multiple myeloma, which is the bone lytic lesions, kidney injury, hypercalcemia, that's gonna be your IgG. And again, 
whenever they say the terms M spike, they're not talking about IgMs. M spikes is just indicating that there is an elevation in immunoglobulins. So multiple myeloma can have an M spike, but have an increased production in IgG. Do not get that confused. It's very confusing with the with the letters and that they always do this and students always get confused and I have to sit there and tell them. Wallenstroth microglobinemia is IgM, multiple myeloma is IgG, and the M spike is in All right. Well, very good. Well, uh, again, uh, well done. This is, uh, you know, one of the probably one of the better Q Lab uh, performances we've seen here uh, in some time. Everyone going, uh, it's going four for four. So uh, I have uh, included the QIDs from tonight's session. So uh, if you've got uh, uh, your USMLE RX fired up, you can either uh, write these down or screenshot it. And then uh, when you're uh, going through QMAX, you can uh, uh, type these in and learn a little bit more uh, about the, uh, the the explanations, especially if you uh, struggled on any of these. Obviously, you'll also be able to make connections with relevant uh, bricks and videos and, uh, and flashcards.